my introductory, oh, I've got to be over here, right? Uh, my introductory remarks uh, are entitled the design, From Designed Artifacts to Effective Spaces and Entangled Systems. It's a great pleasure to be part of this event and to set the stage for talks by my esteemed colleagues, Keith Bowers, Dennis McGlade, and Margie Ruddick. My remarks will focus on the way that our understanding of Olmsted and Vox's intentions for design effects and management can open up new ways of seeing the Central Park woodlands. But I want to preface my uh, argument with a personal aside so uh, you're cognizant of why a landscape architect from Virginia uh, might be asked to come uh, and talk about uh, the New York City um, condition. In the October of 1979, I attended a lecture on the ongoing historic landscape inventory and management plan for one of the Central Park woodlands, the Ramble. As the only landscape architect studying at Cornell's History of Architecture program, I was desperately trying to translate what I was learning in my courses to the discipline I cared about, the design landscape. That lecture opened up a new world for me located at the intersection of design, ecology, and historic preservation. I still have the handwritten notes on a yellow legal pad that captured Bruce Kelly's account of his work with James Fitch and Phil Winslow. I found these notes recently when cleaning out boxes in my basement. Yes, I'm a pack rat. What a revelation they were. Kelly described a way of looking at the design landscape that recognized both its cultural and biophysical heritage. I was amazed at what I jotted down and how uh, much I've internalized uh, some of the lessons I learned in that lecture. Kelly noted that all the original plants in the Rambla died by the 30s, we heard that this morning, and that they've been replaced by opportunistic natives and invasive exotics. He mentioned that the Ramble needed thinning, but that park visitors wanted to keep all of the trees. He referred to Olmsted's visit to Panama, his account of its tropical vegetation, and the impact it had on the kind of woodland character that Olmsted best believes stirred the human imagination. Kelly explained how each group that frequented the Ramble did so at different times of day without much conflict. And I do think it's interesting, he didn't talk about bird watchers, he described the 5 to 9 AMers as the poetic type. From those lecture notes, several themes emerged that have persisted, apparently unresolved for 30 plus years. It's my hope that the discussion this afternoon can move the conversation forward so that this magnificent landscape, a space of constructed nature made on um, reshaped ground, comprised of native and exotic plants functioning as a novel ecosystem and beloved by numerous groups will benefit from a coherent and sustained management plan. The woodlands at Central Park are diverse patches of varying size, density, character, and use. Olmsted and Vox imagine these mysterious rambles, the rough and rude woodlands, and the soothing woodland and meadow verges within a conception of Central Park as a work of art. The park was a constructed urban place that required the movement of vast amounts of soil, planting and replanting, and installation of miles of under drainage. I underscore this point because the park's woodlands are made on regraded and already disturbed sites. Since the first phase of Central Park's construction was the establishment of the rambles, we can appreciate the significance of woodland within the park's larger matrix. The center of the park, its first realized section, was a constructed woodland juxtaposed across the lake with Bethesda Terrace. The woodland was functionally, spatially, and symbolically the park's heart. This constructed matrix of woodlands, groves, glades, and meadows was also a social space. And in Olmsted's words, quote, produce to, um, to, designed to produce certain effects upon the minds of men. That's what he said the role of a public park was, to produce certain effects upon the minds of men. This statement reminds us that Olmsted came to the design of places because he was interested in the health of humans, as well as we might now call the psychology of space. This belief in the role that the woodlands plays in the contemporary minds of men and women was underscored in the Andropogan study 
when the authors wrote, it's a testament to the important and exhilarating sense of freedom that people experience in the park, and the woodlands feel the wildest of all. Over the past 150 years, the park has been more than the aggregation of physical materials and ecological processes. Its advocates today and its creators in the 19th century valued the park for its effects, its influence on the psyche of the people who spend time living near it and moving through it. And this is what differentiates a park from a work of ecological restoration. The interest in the effects of the form and spaces of the landscape on the human spirit. So in addition to being a work of art and a social space, the park was also an experiment in managed biophysical change. As the designers installed the original plant palette of natives and hardy exotics, cognizant of the inevitable growth as well as necessity of clearing and pruning. And herein lies what I think is the conundrum and the creativity of that early vision of the park woodlands. They were to affect the minds of city dwellers whose conceptions of nature, paradigms of ecology, were to change over the next century at the very time that the woodlands themselves would be changed by, changed by succession, neglect, use, abuse, and maintenance when the funds and the will were available. So how can we find clarity in this complexity so that the principles for managing the woodlands are true to their heritage as a cultural landscape as well as to their contemporary functions as wildlife habitat, bird watching opportunity, environmental education, classrooms, all happening in the company of strangers? How can we find stable ground for a management philosophy when our very conception of nature and our understanding of ecological succession have changed rapidly over the past quarter century. How can one even speak of a work of art with all of its associations of authorship, stability, and integrity when the essential characteristic of a woodland is its dynamic natural processes of growth and decay? Through my readings of Olmsted's writings about parks and woods, including the psychological effect of park scenery, his entry park in the American Cyclopedia, and in particular the use of the axe, I have found productive and surprising entanglements of use and effect, design and management, culture and nature, birds, animals and humans, ecology and psychology. By extending these two concepts of effects and managed change to include contemporary concerns, I think park administrators, planners, designers, and park users can create exciting new frameworks for managing the park's 150-acre woodlands. So I want to sketch out a way of thinking and working that is not primarily concerned with whether the management of the woodlands compromises their formal or material design integrity. I want to argue that it's more productive to ask, what were the reasons that the woodlands were created in the first place um, that were included in a design of an urban park? What effects did the designers hope the experience of these woodlands would have, and are these effects still necessary? If so, what type of woodlands would engender those effects, and should new effects um, be added uh, uh, in a new urban woodland agenda? I think through this framework we can circumvent a few past debates about, in des about design integrity that were biased towards the material culture preservation of the woodlands, a vista belongs here, this tree belongs here, we can avoid assuming that our understanding of nature through the current ecological paradigms means that we know best. We can also avoid simplifying the woodlands as a natural other that we need to re revere or overprotect. In other words, I think we can consider our ecological and emotional entanglements with the woodlands as a basis for thought and action. Um, I want to um, uh, start the next part of uh, my argument with a couple of definitions and uh, to focus on uh, the term woodland and to think about what a woodland means as a cultural landscape type. Um, the OED describes it as a land covered with wood or trees and you know okay we get that. But Olmsted and Vox were familiar with a number of um, 18th and 19th century landscape theorists who uh, made it clear that woodlands were not synonymous with forests or with groves. So Thomas Waitley's observation on modern gardens from 1770 
differentiated a wood from other landscape types, uh, such as a forest or a clump. A wood contained both trees and underwood, and it extended over a considerable space. Waitley also wrote of the ways that a designer might edit an existing wood on a property through thinning or thickening. So a woodland was smaller than a forest. It had denser vertical vegetation strata than a clump or a grove and was the result of a designer's discerning judgment to amplify or to alter its form for varied effects. J.C. Loudon in the 1820s underscored the cultural aspects of the woodlands when he wrote that the term wood may be applied to a large assemblage of trees, either natural or artificial, so translate uh, exotic, forest exclusively to the most extensive or natural assemblages. So there was already a sense that a woodland in the early 19th century was a mix of exotic and hardy uh, plants. These definitions reveal differences between woodlands and forests that could be key to managing the Central Park woodlands. The OED also notes that a forest is an extensive tract of land covered with trees and undergrowth, sometimes intermingled with pasture. So they're larger than woodlands, traversing them requires a longer duration. One feels more immersed and enveloped in a forest than a woodland, but there is more to the definition. A forest is also a wild, uncultivated waste, a wilderness. So in addition to size, a woodland can be differentiated from a forest by management. The degree to which its species, its successional pathways, and its character are shaped by human action. And finally, and perhaps most germane to the appreciation of the woodlands um, to Central Park, is the role that woods played in Waitley's influential treatise. His book, quite well known to American designers, locates the modernity of the design landscape of 1770, Observations on Modern Gardening. He locates the modernity in its medium. His first chapters are entitled Of Ground, Of Wood, Of Water, Of Rocks. Unlike earlier treatises that focused on geometry as an organizer of gardens, Waitley's treatise on the landscape garden emphasized geography. In Of Wood, he wrote, of the noblest objects in nature is the surface of a thick wood, commanded from an eminence or seen from below hanging on the side of a hill. Sounds like the ramble to me. So a wood is not secondary to a pastoral meadow or grove. It is central to the imagination of a modern landscape like Central Park. Planning documents over the past two decades offer additional insights into the woodlands as a cultural landscape. The 84 management plan offered this description. The woodlands of Central Park are for the most part imitations of a natural forest environment. They exhibit many of the characteristics of New York's original climax forest, but they are more than pastiches of the native ecology. They are stylized Victorian versions of woodlands. Landscape essays in the style of the picturesque, they include in addition to native species, a number of exotic and oriental plants which were newly imported to America at the time the park was built. Andrew Pogan's interpretation in their 1989 account of the woodlands continues in a similar vein. The rambles were originally designed as a highly stylized imitation of a natural forest, contrived to offer a broad range of habitats from upland to lowland, cave, cove, and wetland compressed into a very small site. They continue, like the rest of Central Park, none of the woodlands is truly a natural landscape. All three sites, meaning the woodlands, were subject to extensive grading, drainage alterations, and planting when the park was developed. Now, however, they feel very natural in character and represent for millions of people a retreat from the city that surrounds them, a contact with nature and the forest, which once blanketed the entire region. Now, in the past 25 years since these passages were written, we've learned a lot more about the history of American landscape architecture as well as ecological succession. In particular, we know more about the native plants movement in the 19th century, as well as the influence of Robinson's hybrid concept, the wild garden, on the design of the ramble. 
we would probably no longer describe the Central Park woodlands as a highly stylized imitation of a natural forest or stylized Victorian versions of woodlands or a climax forest. These descriptions predicated on worn assumptions of dualist binary relationships between nature and culture or on ecological biases about true nature or Clemencian ecological theories that were challenged decades ago reinforce the public's perception that the Central Park woodlands are either inferior, naive attempts at nature imitation, or they are a forest remnant. In other words, one reason for the debates about how to manage the woodlands is the inability for us to discern the distinction between a constructed woodland and a forest and to appreciate the difference um, uh, uh, between those two, uh, one found and the other uh, formed through uh, planting in succession on a, a disturbed site. The second um, point I want to make has to do with the relationship between intention and effects. I'd like to introduce the rationale for including woods within the park in the first place, and in particular including woods in the first phase of construction at the center of the park. Um, we could say it was because of expediency that the remnant woods formed an armature for a constructed woodland. We could posit it was for microclimate uh, protection uh, in hot summer um, temperatures. But Olmsted's writings make it clear that the woods had a motive power. Sarah Cita Miller uh, notes this in her book on Central Park, uh, where she pairs description of the physical features, forms, and spaces of the Rambles woodlands with the function that those elements played in creating an environmental aesthetic experience. She wrote, indeed, Olmsted intended an intricate disposition of light and shadow to create a degree of obscurity, not absolutely impenetrable, but sufficient to affect the imagination with a sense of mystery. So we begin to realize the varied roles that the woods play, their spatial and geometric armatures, their amplified constructed woodlands that were places of effect, that were intended to stimulate the senses and the mind as one walked through the intricate spaces of shady nature in the company of others. The third point um, has to do with this issue of the wild garden and the material of a woodland. Between the time that Olmsted and Vox won the competition and the early 1870s, William Robinson had been, uh, visited the United States on a book tour focused on his influential book, The Wild Garden. This text, as well as Olmsted's visit to Panama, altered Olmsted's vision for the rambles. Rather than a picturesque woods, based on an 18th century landscape theory, he realized that his vision of the ramble was closer to what Robinson wrote about a wild garden. And he wrote, there can be no better place than the ramble for the perfect realization of the wild garden. I want to stock it in that way as fully and rapidly as possible. So what was a wild garden? It was a reaction to the wasteful practice of planting beds of annual flowering plants in public spaces, but the wild garden was far from a wilderness. It was a concept for amplifying the beauty of a region's prototypical cultural landscapes, its woods, hedgerows, meadows, and stream valleys. This amplification occurred by including hardy exotic plants that would extend the blooming season of a regional woodland. Robinson wrote, my object is to show how we may have more of the varied beauty of hardy flowers than even the most ardent admirer of the old style of gardens ever dreamed of by naturalizing many beautiful plants of many regions of the earth in our fields, woods, and copses. And he goes on to say, it applies to the placing of perfectly hardy exotic plants under conditions where they'll thrive without further care. Well, not really, but um, it has nothing to do with an old idea of the wilderness. It does not mean the picturesque garden. My fourth point, does an appreciation of the ramble as a wild garden afford us different ways to think about its management? Does it open up new ways of conceiving of natives and exotics as a novel ecosystem? Does it allow us to consider very different management regimes for the North Woods, the Hallett Nature Sanctuary, uh, and the Ramble? These questions remind us how long management issues have been contested in the park. 
We know from the published Olmsted papers how concerned the designers were about the management of the park. How can their conception of a design landscape as a place of change, of thickening and thinning, allow us to get beyond traditional landscape preservation debates? Here I'll note two processes that were fundamental to Olmsted's interest in change in landscape character, successional growth and what he called the use of the ax. In the 1870s, Olmsted admired a piece of the Parc de Bouchemont in Paris when visiting with its supervising landscape architect, Andre. Andre told Olmsted that the effect was the result of neglect. The park's vegetation had become feral during its occupation by the communards. It acquired a patina of growth, moss, debris, and duff. This appealed to Olmsted as the maintenance crew at Central Park weeded where it was not necessary and vice versa. This is not to say that Olmsted was a hands-off kind of designer. In 1889, he wrote The Use of the Axe, where he quoted 20 significant gardeners and landscape designers, from Repton and Brown to Downing, about the significance of overplanting, thinning, pruning, and clearing. He bemoaned the public outrage that prevents the wise management of a public landscape's woods because it pre uh, prevented the frequent and judicious use of the ax, which is required to make an artificial plantation eventually resemble a natural one. So from these four perspectives, the distinction between a constructed woodland and a forest, the focus on effects versus um, actual species or materials, uh, the uh, distinction uh, between a wild garden uh, and other kinds of woodlands, and this notion of design and management as an important part of change over time, we might consider the role of woodland effects today, what immersion in a mixed species of constructed and amplified woods does for human and non-human species. We might consider the cumulative impact of small acts of pruning, planting, tending, and weeding over long periods of time. Could one imagine the woodlands being made healthier and more biologically diverse through the operations of a new kind of gardening, of the managed processes of succession at a landscape scale. By recognizing the design legacy of the most central woodland, the ramble, as a horticulturally and ecologically complex wild garden, and not a stylized, romantic, ersatz forest, and by emphasizing Olmsted's interest in effects and managed change, Contemporary park administrators, planners, and designers are creating new frameworks for managing uh, the park's uh, acres of woodlands. Through this focus on design effects and change over time, we might finally stop obsessing about nature and culture as unrelated categories in need of balance. Instead, we can begin to manage and imagine designed urban woodlands in light of the effects of changing social use, extreme weather events, and new ecological paradigms such as wildscapes and novel ecosystems, and the affects that the experience of and interaction with these constructed, dynamic, and managed woodlands have on the minds of contemporary men and women. This afternoon's session features three landscape architects whom I've admired very much, whose practices have dealt with imagining, designing, constructing, and managing complex cultural and biophysical landscapes. Keith Bowers, Principal of Biohabitats in Baltimore, Dennis McGlade, Principal of Olin in Philadelphia, and Margie Ruddick of Margie Ruddick Landscapes in Philadelphia. Each will share their design perspectives on woodland design and management, but more importantly, each of them will approach the topic from a different conceptual or theoretical point of view and illustrate uh, their positions with a few examples. I ask you to join me in uh, welcoming uh, the three of them.